Well, hello and welcome back to the Andrew Eborn Show. I'm delighted that we're going to go to the side of the world, all the way over to see the fabulous Angus Crown. How are you, Angus? I'm doing well, Andrew. How are you today? Hey, not too bad. And I tell you what, you've got that nice little red glow about you. Is that because uh, you're over in California? <laughs> yes. No, I don't think so. I think it's just a light. Oh, no, Usually it's early great. in the morning you see, here. You've got there with the sun over there in California. I'm over here in, in good old Blighty. <laughs> it all, it all, yeah. It's fantastic. They're always a you're, 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 It's funny. Yeah, you're you're a little pale to my red. I didn't realize oh, how red I was. Too pale to your red. It's it's the joy of these sort of yeah. online platforms, isn't it? I think you can get little. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it is, it's a little it. weird. So wow. I've I've been listening to some of your fantastic music. Hilarious. Thank you. Thank you. It it's, it sounds good, but you call it. They call you the god father of uke billy punk rock what on earth does that mean well godfather is somebody who has been eight now <laughs> i've heard the godfather bit i love it yeah, Marlon Brando and all that sort of stuff yeah. uh well uke billy punk rock is a sort of like a little mix of of three genres that i put together some years ago which is a ukulele and rockabilly and punk rock and so I've been playing those. It's, it's kind of nice because it's sort of play, it gives me more comfort in playing music. I don't have to stay in one genre, but uh, I'm known as the only rock and roll band that's fronted by a ukulele. So it's fun. I, I enjoy it. And I'll tell you what, I love the ukulele. Ever since, but we have it over here. Um, uh, when, when I'm cleaning windows, the old George Formby. Did you remember seeing him with that's the ukulele? Right. Of course. That's brilliant because it's yeah, yeah, a absolutely. wonderful sound. It's rather like the sax. Yeah. It always makes you smile, doesn't it? It does. It absolutely does. He actually played more of a, uh, it's sort of, sort of like the ukulele banjo is what he did. Uh, but I am a fan of his and I think it's wonderful that, you know, he's remembered today with millennials, you don't remember, <laughs> you know, to a certain point, but uh, he's awesome. I, I've always appreciated him. And, you know, the ukulele is a fun instrument. It's an easy instrument to learn. It's something that you can strum a few times and get a couple of basic chords. You know, George Harrison used to drive around and have about 50 of those in his trunk and he'd give a ukulele to anybody who would listen to him. So it's a fun instrument. Oh, there used to be people running after the cars just in case they got one. Absolutely. So if you've got one yeah, of those exactly. ukuleles, let us know. Absolutely. It's always a thrill. So how did you get started? Well, I, get, I mean, I've always been a creative person. I was behind the scenes for many years. Um, I was a concert producer. So, and I also, I mean, going back even further, I owned a vaudeville theater and that, that kind of dates me right there because a lot of people don't remember vaudeville, um, but I do. Um, but I, I produced concerts, I produced Queen, I produced uh, a lot of electronic music, uh, Fat Boy Slim, Paul Oakenfold, Boy George. So I did that for a while. Um, and then just about five or six years ago, I just decided to kind of take my own show on the road. And it's been good so far. I mean, I, I find that my music, I'm very quirky. So, and I like that. That's a positive with my music. And as a storyteller, um, I get a lot out of presenting a good story uh, with a little flair to it. And I think the ukulele is a great instrument to do that. No, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and it is, I mean, talk about great storytelling. I mean, you've got such a diverse armory, if you like, and rich history in the music industry. Uh, being a producer for some of those acts, Talk to me about that sort of stage of your life as a producer. How did you find that? Well, I liked it a lot. It was really interesting. I, I've said this story a few times about Brian May and Anita Dobson. So, you know, I was a fan of Queen for you know my life, just like most sane people are. I mean, you have to be a fan of Queen. Uh, in fact, I just saw a hashtag you just did and you put Queen on there. And I, I wanted to ask you, what was it? What was it? Well, that that, um, but, particular, that particular one was for a different artist. It was the producer. Which oh, okay. Was yeah, no, I saw that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that. Fantastic. Um, but, but Brian, Brian May is brilliant. Professor Brian May. Uh, we oh, yeah, love all this stuff. Yeah. No, yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, we. I basically were a fan of Queen for many years, and I was running some big nightclubs in Los Angeles, and I reached out to Jackie Smith, who is uh, the longest-running president of a fan club, and uh, she's been with Queen since the mid 70s. She started with her sister. Make a long story short, I said, I have these clubs. I saw that the uh, band are getting a, a star in the Walk of Fame. So I'd love to put a little party together for them. Uh, that simple email ended up being me producing the first Queen concert in the US uh, had, you know, since Freddie had passed away. 
And subsequently, you know, as a result of that, my we became friends with Brian and my wife's a uh, television fashion designer and she became friends with Anita. And so we flew to London and we saw the musical We Will Rock You at the Dominion Theater. So my first double date is with this rock legend and his, you know, very famous wife. And what was really cool about it is, you know, you're sitting in the audience and I'm literally, you know, I'm the guy that used to take the little tape deck and put it at my ear when I went to bed to listen to Queen, right? Um, and I'm looking at Brian's fingers and they're, they're just slowly moving to the chords. We're watching his music and I'm just literally looking at it. And he does, a, I mean, I'm assuming he didn't know, but his fingers were sort of moving to it, but it was fun. Um, after the show, everybody saw that he was in the audience and then they went rushing him and they went rushing Anita and my wife went running with them. And I'm just standing there like, bring it on, bring it on, <laughs> you know, come rush me. And, and, it's, and both of them, both Anita, I mean, we know her over here from, from the soaps originally. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Called Angie and EastEnders. Uh, but they're yeah. very, very good at dealing with the public. And they're the same with Sir Paul McCartney. You, you turn around and they know it's a role that you play as part of the part of the, the job description, if you like, but they're both really good at it, aren't they? They are, yeah, I think, and he's a good soul. I think, uh, you know, I, I, um, the thing about Anita that I love so much, she's very humble and she's, she's just, she's really, and I think this is, if, I think this is true that she's everybody's actress. Like she doesn't place herself way over there. She's not untouchable. She's a very sweet woman. And of course, Brian is very dear and tender. Um, and just, I mean, a genius, all, all four of those guys are geniuses, but it's nice. And when you go into that level and you're there for a few minutes, it's pretty exciting, but to be there all the time, it would be a, a it would be a, a real, uh, heavy weight to carry all the time. And what's also incredible, Angus, is that they reinvented themselves. I mean, having lost such an iconic front man as Freddie. Uh, Queen yeah. have gone on. They, they've um, got together with, uh, uh, with 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 Ben, and and they did. We will rock you. Um, yeah, yeah. Jim has been superb at managing them, uh, and you basically their catalogue, if you like, ever since the good old Live Aid, when Freddie did that iconic performance. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, everybody woke up to Queen, didn't they? I think that was the moment. Is that yeah. fair to say? Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. I'm I'm a I'm a long-term Freddie fan, like most people. Are. I love Freddie Mercury. Um, he came. To, I wrote a book many years ago. It's a, a side story, but he came to me in a dream one day, and and it's really weird. I'm dreaming. I had a dream, and there's Freddie Mercury, and I'm like, "There's no way you're Freddie Mercury." And he goes, "No, I am." I'm like, "There's no way. I'm dreaming, and you're dead." He goes, "No, no, no. One day we're going to be connected." And I'm like, "This is impossible." And then guess what? A few years later, I'm producing Queen. That, that, right? See, that's what happened. I, I love it. <laughs> which, which, which other dreams have you had then, Angus? Who else, who else was in your dreams? Paul Oakenfold? Yeah. That must have been good. Did he? Yeah. He turned up in I a like dream? Paul. No, no. Paul was fun. We, uh, we, we had Paul in uh, LA for the 2000. So the year 2000, we did a, um, a, uh, a you know, New Year's Eve party and he played on Hollywood Vine, Hollywood Boulevard and Vine. And he played The Streets Have No Name by U2, and he's kind, he was fun. I mean, Boy George is a very dear person to me too. Um, I mean, I look at, at George kind of like in the world of Freddie. I mean, they're so one-offs and, and they really are who they are. And there's, um, it's unabashed. I mean, you, you are at that point, you are who you are and it's beautiful to see. Yeah, and, and that's what I love about both Freddie and, and, and Boy George is, as you say, be yourself because everybody else is taken. And, and in a, in a yeah. day and age when, when it first, when Freddie was first there, it was, it was a tough era, wasn't it? When he was what? When, 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 it, when Freddie was first out there, it was a oh, society yeah. which didn't really forgive. I mean, you, you get a little flavor of it in, in, in the movie, yeah. Bohemian Rhapsody, but, but the reality, it was a tough time, I think. If, if you're a gay yeah. man in that sort of world, it was very tricky. It is, and I think that he's one of those people that was so determined and he knew exactly what he wanted and how he wanted it and how he was gonna go around and getting it done. I find as a as a performer and a writer and a musician, it's you have to find your own voice. I think today is is much much more difficult for musicians with a singular voice or a singular style. 
because we are a you know, we are a world of everybody wants to have something to say, everybody wants to produce some kind of material. So I think it's much harder to be that way. And then even for his his world and what, what who he was as an internal person, I think the world today, people are more open to that. People kind of, you know, they, it's just part of the the um, the fabric of discussion. I will say though, it's interesting with with Bohemian Rhapsody. I think I think as an entertainment piece, I think Bohemian Rhapsody is a nice entertainment movie. But I do think it, it does change some of the narrative, and you know, you have to you have to understand. And I see a lot of things out there that you can't take everything as it is. I mean, Freddie was living, I and mean, Freddie had a business with Roger. They had a clothing stall. He, you know, they were all friends and. You know, this the way it shows in the movie is quite different than the reality of it. And I think today's world, we we take what we see as as fact, and then we work from you know we work backwards from that. So yeah, I mean, that's what I'm also, saying. Angus, as, as they say, Angus, never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. Yeah. And, I, I and you're that, a lawyer. And you're a lawyer, so you know that. <laughs> as, as, as a lawyer, um, and it was the same. I, I had a, a good friend who. Um, uh, with the Elton John movie, Rocket Man, uh, yeah. a good friend called Ray Williams, um, who discovered Elton, uh, basically, yeah. Ray and our yeah. man, and Ray put uh, Elton and Bernie together, and uh, yeah. he, he said the same about the movie, a very, very different story, a bit of artistic license, but it was a great yeah. narrative. And, and you were it is, and it's... It is, and you know, I actually enjoyed, boy, I hate to say this, but I enjoyed Rocket Man more than Bohemian Rhapsody, and I think I did because the storyline for me was something I was, I, I knew more of. And cause like, I, I knew, I know Queen inside and out, but I think the storyline was more true in some ways in uh, Elton's mo uh, movie than it was in Bohemian Rhapsody. But it is interesting. I mean, as time goes on and legend is created, it's uh, you just kind of take things as it comes. You have to figure out what's the truth and what isn't. Well, absolutely, and, and it's an industry where people want to have yeah. everything on show and things like that. I mean, the uh, uh, the Queen, which you saw hashtagged, was actually um, uh, Nicki Minaj. That, that's why. Okay, I, yeah. I had I had an ah, album. gotcha. Okay, there you go. So that that was that album. We were talking about that sort of side. And I, I was talking to okay. Jay Reed, who was uh, her producer on that sort of side. But that's what that. Oh was yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, but, but yes, there are many queens out there, which is interesting. Um, and, and talking of that sort of side, I mean, the, the other thing that we have about the changing face of the industry, uh, there's a brilliant series at the moment but with Russell T. Davis called It's a Sin, which is all about that sort of the, 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 the period in the 80s when the AIDS epidemic first came out here. Yeah. And being gay was something which uh, people just couldn't talk about it. There was certain things which were illegal and so on and so forth. And there was the absolute terror and the absolute prejudice that used to dominate uh, society. Yeah, it's interesting though, huh? Like as time has gone by, you can't imagine, today you can't imagine that's the way it was. Um, I love the 80s. I mean, I'm a product of the 80s. Um, I, I, I look back at the 80s with a lot of love and affection. In fact, I, I actually, many, 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 many years ago, uh, we had gone to, my wife and I had gone to heaven you, do you remember heaven? Oh, heaven? And then you have a, a smaller place which is called Halfway to Heaven. Um, yeah, yeah. That sort of stuff, absolutely. That was forever. And I we had to go there. I mean, sometimes those kind of clubs are more fun. But uh, we went there just because it was just an iconic place to visit. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I think things have was really were really different back then. But it also was an age of creativity that I don't think had come out. I think the 70s were extremely creative. But I think the 80s just brought it to a more of a, you know, I, I get called post-punk, my music is post-punk. So um, a lot of post-punk came out of the early eighties and the, the mid eighties. And I think that there was a level of creativity with that, that really opened the door to so much more to come musically. And, and, and you're right, I think every era we, we look at, I mean, we, we just lost uh, Mary Wilson, uh, obviously yeah. from, from the sixties and the Supremes yeah. and, that, and they sort of dominated that sort of side. And then they reinvent themselves, didn't they? You have like, a, there was then the seventies Supreme when yeah. um, Diana had gone off, Diana Ross had gone off to do her own thing. But the seventies was sort of dominated, if you like 77, 76, 77 by the whole punk era. Talk to me yeah. about that sort of side and that sort of influence on you, the Sex Pistols. Yeah, I love the Sex Pistols. I love the Stooges. I love Iggy Pop. I mean, if if you listen to my music, Williams, that sort of side, absolutely. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I, I for me, you know, punk music for me is is just I I'm 51 years old, 
and I, I, I think I look okay for 51. I don't um, I, I don't so, a red glow. I've told you got the California. Yeah, right. yeah, I'm just <laughs> bursting here. I feel like a pimple. <laughs> Burst pimple. You know, I, I think for me, punk rock was kind of interesting because I loved it at the time, but I didn't feel it until I was in my, my 40s, quite honestly. Um, you know, as you get older, there's so much you you feel. There's and it, I don't want to use the word rage because it's not rage, but there's there's a level of, of expression that you want to put out there. And as you get older and older and older, I think you come more to a consciousness of it, where when you're youthful and you've got all this stuff you want to push out there, it just comes from a youthful perspective. You're like pushing everything. But now, as a person, and we all become wise, even the dumbest ones, we do become wise as we get older. I felt for me, um, punk is more about releasing some tension, but as an older learned man, um, my first record has more punk in it. Uh, but I do feel like every musician or every person has those emotions. And I think you have to touch upon every emotion you have, because if you let some things put aside and you don't deal with those emotions, I don't think you're a full human. And I think that, you know, you just, some days you have to be angry. Some days you have to love. Some days you have to feel, you know, dominant and, and submissive. Like you need all of these human feelings to really be a complete person. So I, for me, punk music really You're gets absolutely me. Right. Yeah. yeah I, you know, punk they say anger is an energy, isn't it? It is. It is. And it's, it's, it's honest. I, and I mean, why don't you want to be honest? I think with some of my music, I mean, I wrote a song, I can't say the words, but you know, I, it's the, the song is called Lullaby Blues and it's for, for my first record. And you know what? It's very hard. It, there's, it's all swears, but it's great. And I actually sing it at the end of every show. I dedicate it to the audience. And then although it's fast and it's in your face, it's punching, punching. At the very end of it, we go into a jazzy blues kind of style. So, so yeah, it's punk in your face. But then when we're singing it like a, 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 a blues quartet, it becomes funny. And, and you sort of like, oh, okay. So, you know, using your example of anger, I mean, yeah, sometimes you can be angry, but sometimes it's fun. Sometimes you just have to be there. You're right. It's that human condition where that you used to get yeah. sugar, sugar, glossy pop and that sort of side. And everybody loves everybody and all that sort of like the hippie days and things like that, which is yeah. wonderful. But that's one part of the emotion. That's one part of the day. And, and that old Shakespearean thing, if you prick me, do I not bleed? If, I, if you tickle me, do I not laugh? The reality is, we all have issues and demons to deal with, don't we? Yeah, absolutely. In my, in my latest record, Let's Fly, I do a song called Rosé Wine, which is very interesting because somebody did a uh, write-up of, of it. And they, the Rosé wine, rose wine is about just being somebody that just accepts life as it is, who doesn't push themselves, who doesn't want to be more than what they've, they've decided they want to place themselves at. And it's completely opposite of who I am. And, but the writer had said, usually rock and roll is like to, you know, write songs about living high and all this stuff. And, you know, it seems like Angus is happy just that way. And I'm thinking like, you must be an idiot because every song that I write is not literally about me and how I feel. There's something in there. And that song was really about not wanting to be that person. And I think that as you do get older, you do have an understanding of what you like and, and what you don't like. And and stuff, but yeah, I think musically, we all have to, we, we all, as a musician, we all have to touch on emotions because sometimes people can't do that. You know, sometimes the listener, you're doing that for the listener. You have no idea why you wrote the song, but you're writing these songs because it's gonna connect to someone out there and they're gonna come back and be like, oh, I, I, just, I just realized something about myself. Yeah. And I think that's important, isn't it? It's Mr. Cellophane, as they say in that uh, uh, in, the, in the classic thing. You you want to make a difference, and and it's, it's rather like mental health. You you want to be the, the the sort of generation that talks about these issues, so that the next yeah. generation doesn't suffer the stigma. Yeah, and I wonder what the hell the next generation is going to be talking about because this generation's music is so. I God, I hate to say it. I mean, I have a a college age daughter, and and you know, I'm happily married. And my wife. We've been married for over 20 years. And I mean, it's, I just don't get it. You know, like you do get to a certain age and you're like, you kids get off my lawn. You know, like you're so angry at everybody. I write music. You become your parents, don't you? You do. Yeah, you really do. But I mean, like, I, it's funny, like, cause my, I, in my, my latest record, I do a song that it's actually the title track called Let's Fly. And it's got a little like 
hip hop ish kind of feel. It's a good vibe kind yeah, of thing. I, I love it. I, I, I listen to it. Yeah, it's it's, com it's completely out of my my normal zone, but I like it. So I, I I mean I can sit on this side of the fence and say I don't understand that, but there are pieces of you know little pieces that I take from it that I do enjoy. But yeah, I do find I agree hundred percent. I do think that music is generational and. I think the what comes out of it is really what was before it. And it's kind of like fashion. I mean, you do recycle fashion just as much as you Absolutely. recycle. You do wonder that when we say about sort of the eighties being the heyday and lots of my chums and uh, people like Toya and Mark Almond and, and Tony Hadley and all that sort of glorious yeah. groups of those sort of age um, are still there. And they, people are still listening to this sort of fantastic stuff. And you do wonder what's going to come out of the current spate of, uh, of artists. You yeah. do think, what are we going to be listening to in 20 years time? Will people look back in the same way as we look back with fondness, even to the, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s? We, those are the golden era, wasn't it? Yeah, it's interesting you say that because as a musician, I'm always 100% uh, compared to Ian Dury, which is for me an honor. I love Ian Dury. Um, uh, Talking Heads, The Clash, uh, Jonathan Rickman and the Modern Lovers, and the list goes on, but the list really stays from the late 70s to like 1986, like January 12th, 1986. They, they don't compare my music to anybody else after that date. But the interesting thing is, is like, I understand them. That, that, that's who I am inspired by. But now that I'm in the world and there aren't a lot of people like me and there aren't a lot of people with my style of music and storytelling and I'm very, and it is quirky. And, um, you know, there is a point where I, I wonder as a musician, how singular am I in this? Because they do reference and they do refer to me, you know, from people that inspired me. I had a viral hit in the US called Man Bun. So, you know, man bun is pretty basic, right? It's the man bun. And I, I just- I get it, I get it. It's I great. can't figure it out, right? I'm just like, this makes no sense to me. So I wrote this song. It's a wonderful song that's talking about man bun in a very negative way. But I mean, it was a hit for me and it was fun. It's a funny song and I love it. But, you know, they started, uh, they started comparing me to Weird Al Yankovic. <laughs> and I'm like, well, wait a second. It's one funny song. You can't just like- tool me over here and say, put him in that shed because that's where he belongs. But it's a good, it's a, it's a actually, a, you, but, but you have to have this kind of conversation with the person of a certain age because they, we understand what it was like before cell phones and before oh, yeah, computers. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we, we, and I'll say this properly, we queued up at the record shop, right? We sat there, we stood there, we went, we waited, we, we read newspapers, we read the, the you know, the music publishing papers. And, and we, that's how we followed it. So we were very, very, you know, knowledgeable of the industry where today is, is completely different. Well, that's I, why I you're, you're right. I think what, what, what I love as well, Angus, is you would queue up. You, you would wait to yeah. hear over here the chart show. You would probably sit there with, with your cassette recording, your TDK blank tape. You record the yeah. chart show, yeah. you listen yeah. back to it. You'd go along yeah. the record shops, the WH Smiths over here, and you'd buy your seven inches. And, and you used to trade them with pieces. They were works of art, weren't they? Yeah. I had uh, in my, so my last record, I toured the UK in 2019 with my band and we were promoting uh, my record at the time called Unobservant Idiot. And, uh, and so there's a song on there called Snickerdoodle Girl. And I wrote that for my wife. Um, it's a bluesy bass, very heavy bass song, but a reviewer, and I love this. It meant so much to me. It, it really did. The reviewer said, this is the kind of song we would have gone to the schoolyard on Monday and heard on the old gray, the old- Old gray whistle test. Old gray whistle test. That's and okay. we would listen to it and we would come there and we would have pondered the meaning of life. And I thought, yes, like, like I could connect to that because yeah. that was a true emotion of my generation beyond what we have to, because today you don't ponder anything. You just go on the cell phone and you figure out what you just questioned, right? But I love that because it was really, it, it created the, the thought and the process of something just happened. I need to go talk to my friends or my mates and I have to figure this out. Like we, we've got something in front of us, it's a challenge and we got to figure this out. 
So I love that. It was a wonderful oh, no, feeling. Right, and that's the other thing as well. I mean, we, we talked about Freddie, we talked about Boy George, where it is, it's the whole package, it's the brand. And I remember uh, sitting as, I mean, we're roughly the same sort of age, and I remember sitting in front of the television and seeing Boy George on Top of the Pops for the first time. Yeah. And it was, it's, it's rather like, it's what they call a, a water cooler moment. Where yeah. were you when you first saw Boy George come on the television? Because nobody knew what to make of it. Yeah. I, I first met Boy George in 1984 at a, at a nightclub in Los Angeles, and we became friends for a little bit. And he always came out in the clubs. I was the, my older brother owned the two largest clubs in Los Angeles, and he, he performed there many times. George and I have a, actually a very special moment. He was DJing, and uh, he was at the club, and he's DJing to about 5,000 people. That's how big these nightclubs were. And he's DJing, it's just him, and I'm actually on the stage next to him a couple of feet away and he pulls out one of his you know 45s you know uh i can't think of the thing but he just looked at it and goes look at this it's 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 an original and i looked at him and i said you know george you're an original just like freddie and it's like the world stopped it's like it was just a moment it, it was pretty cool you know and it's just like those moments that as we get older as we can go back and recollect like this was the time you know, I remember the first time I saw Boy George in person. I remember the first time I listened to Queen. I remember the first time, you know, I love Blondie. I'm a huge Blondie fan. I remember the first time I heard Sunday Girl. It's still on my track list. I still listen to it all the time. But yeah, but you have to get older. See, that's the problem. Like these things that matter to you, they just, if you're lucky, it matters to you very young because you have a, an old soul and maybe an old heart. So you understand those emotions. But for the most of us, we got to get a little older. We got to become more learned. We have to feel these emotions. And then all of a sudden it clicks. You're like, ah, that's something I have to remember. It me it's very meaningful to me. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I, I have a, a business with uh, RJ Gibb, who's the son of Robin Gibb from the Bee Gees. Uh, mm. And it's a similar sort of thing. They're going through the same thing as Queen did. We all sort of say, well, look what happened with Queen's catalogue. And the Bee Gees yeah. like, were 10 years before that. And so we shine yeah. the spotlight on that. They've done the documentary. There's discussions about the movie and so on and so forth. But what RJ and I are doing, we're celebrating the music of uh, the Bee Gees as well. So RJ is a great singer-songwriter in his own right. Robin was great and had his own fantastic hits. I mean, for example, yeah. the, the song he had uh, called Juliet was 15 weeks at number one throughout Europe. And if you look yeah, at when he was... children of a certain age, there's yeah. either Juliet's or Julius's, Juli uh, Julius's <laughs> named yeah, yeah. after Robin's song. And it's shining a spotlight on that music, which I think is important. That's an interesting time because that's when he was estranged from his brothers when he was a solo artist. See, that just tells you I know him, I, I connect to it, right? My One of my biggest regrets musically, I was literally telling my wife last week about this, was they were playing, the, the Bee Gees were playing in Las Vegas. They had a long run there and I could have gone to see them. <laughs> and I never did and I'm like, I can't believe I, I cause now you, you go on YouTube and you're like, you're watching all this wonderful music and you're like, ah, oh, this is great. But uh, yeah, it, it's interesting too, cause he, that band is just amazing too. I mean, it's not my genre of music, but I mean, I can rock down to it just like most people can. Um, I think they were such a collective group and talk about one voice and and, and one message. But um, yeah, it's great. It's interesting that you're working in that, in that area because I mean, this resurgence, you know, music has had, the 80s kind of came back in like the early 2000s, the late 90s when they were doing these tours and the, you had the Go-Go's and you had, you know, ABC and all these other bands. But I think today the going back now is more meaningful because I think that additional 10 to 20 years has really made an impact as far as- the I mean, We have all these big festivals or we used to have these big festivals, yeah. things like the Rewind because all the people growing up of, of our age, that, those are our sort of memories if you like. And all of a sudden we've got a bit more money so we can yeah. go and enjoy the festivals. And it's not just the music. There's the whole look. People go and put their leg warmers on. They get the dealy box. Yeah. You have the neon colors, whatever it happens to be, to just to enjoy that whole experience. Yeah, it is interesting how, how you can get out there and, and have fun that way and, and do things. I mean, is I would love to see, I hope the festivals come back. I'm, I'm hoping to tour it um, next year back in, in uh, England. I, I, I am hoping that things go back to normal. And I think musically that, you know, most musicians are hoping the same, but you are right. I mean, now we can go back and we can enjoy things a little bit more. 
No, I, I, th I think you're right. I and mean, I think when we talk about normal, I think going back to normal may take a little while. We'll have a new normal. Um, and what, yeah. what, is, what, what, what what's happened in this pandemic is that technology has been forced. People have been forced to accept that we communicate in this sort of way. I, yeah. I, I was doing the show um, beginning of la well, at the end of last year in a big studio with lots of cameras everywhere and everything else. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, those sort of days, we can do this. Yeah. We can connect in a different way. And a lot of artists are sitting at home. Uh, Toyo's a great mate. We're married to Robert Fripp. And they're reinventing themselves. What Toyo is so, such a brilliantly creative mind. They're coming up with these little videos, which are so wonderfully quirky that they just go viral and getting Robert in a tutu and stuff like that is just hilarious. <laughs> we love all that. It is cool. interesting. It is interesting. I mean, there's uh, my, my basis. He does this thing on Reddit. I, I, I mean, I quite honestly, I'm on, I'm on, you know, I do my searches and I do things online, but I don't, I don't live online, but he's young. He's the only, he's the youngest member in my band, but he's doing this Reddit thing now and he's playing music and he's like, oh, dude, this is so cool. You know, I'll just be there and I'll be playing. I've got like 5,000 people watching me and it's just so interesting. And, you know, they're talking to me. Some say they love what I'm doing. Some say they want me dead. I'm like, wait a second. You're literally playing to somebody who's like, I want you dead. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that. I mean, as bored as I get, I don't think I want to do that. But it is interesting, this whole, I mean, I'm enjoying this time with you. I feel like we're connecting because we have maybe some similar, you know, uh, memories and things like that. But I do think sometimes just because the technology is there, it doesn't necessarily mean it's easy to, to, to kind of like, you know, navigate through um, and, and connect to people because I'm a human person. I'm a hugger. I like to talk to people. I'm as extroverted as I am introverted. I'm, I'm probably the perfect max, you know, mix where I'm like, I don't want to see the world today. And then the next day is like, just give me the world. Yeah. But, and, and that's, that's human nature. And, and as I say, I always think, I mean, you're, you're right, Angus, I always say that uh, the more means of communication that there are, the less we're able to communicate. And I think yes. nowadays people don't talk. No, it's so weird. Our daughter, I mean, she's my daughter's a very spiritual, she can communicate well. But her, her generation, and even up to like 35, it's kind of weird, because like, they just don't. There's something that that triggered with technology that just changed the mix. And I don't get it. Like, I'll say hi to people. And uh, they sometimes don't say hi back. And I'm like, what did I do? <laughs> like, you know, I'm clean shaven. I showered. Like, all I said was hello. But that's another part of it. It's also it's like the communication thing. There's a void sometimes. But then there's an emotional void. And like wearing a mask all the time right now, it's I smile. And when you look at people, you just you just see their eyes and your eyes, as much as they would tell you, can tell you, your eyes say a lot about the, your inner person. Well, when you have a mask on, you, you don't see everything in your eyes. So you don't see smiles. You don't see, you know, just a human like glance. I mean, those things do matter. They do matter well, a lot. And basic things like hugging and so on and so forth. You talk yeah. About earlier when when the days when it was it was just footballers who used to hug and uh, <laughs> all that sort of stuff um yeah. but you're right and i think that it is it is very interesting i mean we have uh, probably children the same sort of age I, I, my my daughter is really into people like green day for example she loves that sort yeah. of thing. great and, and my son loves loves oasis and that sort of stuff so yeah. looking back those iconic moments are fantastic i mean you you've also yeah. worked with um fat boy slim haven't you so how, how did that I have a really weird story on that one. I don't know if I should say it because it's I, being from the US and not being, you know, in the UK all the time. I don't know who amongst musicians and performers are friends and not friends, but I referred to him once to somebody who's very famous and they didn't. <laughs> I guess Norman can can sometimes put people off. Um, I liked him. I thought he was cool. It was at a time where he was really hot and popular and stuff. And one of his songs uh, where Christopher Walken had done the dancing video, uh, they just won a, an award for it. And I congratulated him on it. And he said, I had nothing to do with it. I mean, that was really Spike, Spike Jones and, and Christopher Walken did it. I, I like Norman. I think he was a, he's one of those guys. I mean, he's creative. He, he can put some things together and it really, you know, matriculates quite well and it, it gets to where he's going. I think some people like him, I would consider him almost like a songwriter in his own sense. He may not use a lot of words, 
but the music and the sound bites and where he's moving it, it emotionally takes you there. And just like words, words take you to a place. So I would see him as that, but uh, he signed a, he signed, he had a promotional poster and, and the light was literally coming from, you know, his behind, like he was standing there. It just on the poster was great. And he just says, you know, he signed it, you know, all light comes from my arse, <laughs> like that, which is funny as hell. I have to make sure I don't swear, by the way, because I've swore in other interviews. <laughs> and it's, I'm not- I, think, I think we can forgive you on, 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 on that sort of thing. Yeah. He's, he's a real, and they always always Oscar Wilde who said that the only thing worse than being talked about is not being talked about. And I know, right? Yeah. That's what you want. I love You've got to have, I mean, they call it Marmite over here. The brand has done very well because they always associate that. You either love or you hate it. That's yeah. fine. That's the nature yeah. of the you will never, otherwise you go back to what you're saying beforehand, be Mr. Cellophane, and then nobody's yeah. Mar Marmite, it's a Marmite moment. Remember when the- and good uh, for the brand. Remember when men at work. You know? part yeah, remember when, it always makes me think about Vegemite. Have you ever had Vegemite? Oh, yes, of course I have, the Australian- uh, Yeah, Vegemite. I know, yeah, when men at, what's that? Which do you prefer? Do you have a preference? Not Vegemite. <laughs> I'll eat anything but Vegemite, I had a Vegemite. I had Vegemite in 1984 when Men at Work were popular. I feel I still have the taste in the back of my tongue because it was so putrid. It's like petrol. <laughs> it's like how do people of a, a, a civil a civilized community eat this and say this is very tasty? I think I'll have more. Absolutely, living in a land down under, they get those Men at Work. No, we loved that. So yeah, I grew yeah, they up. had to go. Yeah, I grew up on the equivalent, which we had over here, which is slightly, I guess, slightly more bitter. It's, it's Marmite. Have you had Marmite? I have, and I'm okay with that. Oh, oh that's good. Hooray for the British. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. But I love I have both. Done. You know, I, I think I yeah. have a bit of Vegemite. I'm happy to do that. I, 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 I can't do it. If, if my wife came home with Vegemite, we would divorce. <laughs> I see you and the Vegemite well, out of the house now. You know, what's going to happen, Angus, if she does, having watched this back, and she will do, she's going to watch them one day when you have a big row, she'll come with that little pot of Vegemite and put it on your That's table. Right. In your face. How's that? Absolutely. She's funny. Actually, my wife, my wife, I don't, I don't know if how popular the show Project Runway is. Oh, yeah, uh, it's been very popular here. So she was on Project Runway, and, and she's known, she has a really awesome, cool hairstyle. <laughs> And uh, it's fun going out with her because people know her here. Like I can be, people know me a little bit more in England than they do here. Cause in the US music is a little tough. And that's why I push my music more to the, the European market. Right. But it's fun walking around with her. Cause everyone's like, I know you, you know, and they just come rushing up on her, which is well, cute. Well, we should get her on the show. We'll get the both of you on the show. That'd be lovely. Yeah, that would be fun, huh? Yeah, yeah, she's super cool. Yeah, brilliant. So how did the two of you meet? Oh, that's a very interesting story, actually. So are you a spiritual person, Andrew? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm very spiritual. I wouldn't say I'm religious, but I'm very, very spiritual. So my mother had just passed away in 1990, uh, 1998, and I had moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I had this burning feeling to go to this bar. I had been going to this bar every Wednesday night, and uh, I was going there and this one Wednesday night, I was running late, but I had to get there. And I didn't know why, but I, I had to get there. So I got there and a friend of mine said, hey, do you want to play pool? And I said, yeah, I'd love to play pool. And so he goes, well, I'm playing with this guy. So why don't you pick somebody? And I said, well, I'm not here with anyone, but I'll play pool with one of those girls at the bar. So my wife's name is Amy. She was one of the girls at the bar. So she, she played pool. She was my partner. I had never met her. And uh, she was there for a date and the guy never showed up. And I said, well, if we win, I get to ask you and, you know, I get to take you out tomorrow. And she said, if we win, you get the, you get the, uh, you get the chance to ask me out to, on a date. So we played and I lost the game. And uh, I said, well, what's your phone number? And so she gave me her phone number. It's a crowded bar. And I wrote it down. And all I knew was her name, Amy, and I had her phone number. So the next day I called her and I had the wrong number. I only knew her name, her first name, and I had her wrong phone number. So for four hours, I am taking these seven digits and I'm moving them around and I'm trying to call and I'm calling and people are like, no, she, there's no Amy here. You've called three times, stop calling. So, you know, in my infinite wisdom, I went back to the bar and I sat outside and I'm looking at a store across the way and 
it's an empty storefront. And I started talking to my mother. She had just passed away. And I'm like, there's something about this girl. She really rocked my world that night. And, you know, we, all we did was play pool, but there was just something about her. So I talked to my mother and, and I'm like, boy, if there's anything you can do to help me right now, that would be pretty awesome. And so I had a quarter, which back then is what it cost to make a phone call, put it in the phone booth because I didn't have a cell phone. It was that old. And I took one number, a nine, and I turned it into a six. I call that number and I heard a girl answer. And I said, is this Amy? She said, yes. I said, is this Amy from the pollinator bar? She goes, yes. I said, well, uh, this is so-and-so. And she's like, and I'm like, um, I can't believe I found you. I said, I know I'm like four hours late, but can I still take you out to dinner? And she goes, well, it's gonna take me about another hour and a half to get ready. And I said, well, I've waited you know, all of this time. I think I can wait another hour and a half, but that's it. Like I literally had her name and, and her wrong phone number. That's, that's wonderful. And how, how many, so 1984, George Orwell there, your mother was there. Fantastic. Yeah. I love it. And you've been together ever since. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we just celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary. So we've been together about almost 24 years. Oh, and I, still, I still like puppy love. It's good. I mean, that's that's the beauty of, of you know, having a failed marriage and then having a, a, a beautiful marriage after that. I mean, you really know what you want. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. And we have a great daughter named Delilah, who's in, uh, in second year of college, and she's a lot of fun. She doesn't understand my music. <laughs> who does bob geldof's children doesn't they they don't understand oh, his music it. it's, it's, but that's that's what you like isn't it they're the great grounders but I, as i say my daughter and my son they they like the sort of music that i like as well so i, I have to say yeah. growing up on that sort of stuff is is fantastic well we've got valentine's day coming up um how are you going to celebrate yeah. with your wife i mean it's a lovely story Every day is valentine's day see we're not the kind of people well, that do <laughs> we love it i know like, well, you know, it's funny because like most of my music, so I was, we were just talking yesterday, I'd done an interview and I was saying that, you know, Amy is my muse for, for most of my music. I have to say most because some music I'm singing about hating people and I'm telling them. To I've like, listened to your tracks. Themselves. I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of it's like not so nice, but I'm like, you know, for all the lovey-dovey stuff, I mean, it's all, it's all about her. In fact, she just, she just had a birthday and I released a single called Amy's Rainbows, oh. which is a quirky song that I would be fun if the Muppets picked up because it's a, just a cute little song. Um, but yeah, we don't, I mean, we're not those people. I mean, every day we're doing something that celebrates love and happiness. And, you know, we're talking about emotions. I think a good marriage has to go up and down too. I think you have to love and hate and figure out, you know, how do we get through the next day together oh, no, for I, it to I, be? I agree. We've been, my, my wife and I have been together for, I mean, quarter of a century and you, you work on that. Yeah. Thing. We're in an industry where marriages yeah. traditionally don't don't succeed. Um, because yeah, right. This way and that way, and you have to understand. You're right. Understand that not every day is going to be rainbows, as you say. Yeah, you have to go yeah. on the roller coaster. Yeah, and it's okay. I mean, there are days like I, you know, it, you're a long term marriage, so there are times where you're like, "What am I doing? You know, why are you like this? You weren't like this, you know, five years ago." And like, can't you understand I'm growing and you got to grow with me? I, I, you don't have to be exactly the same person, but you got to grow a little bit with me. But it, it feels so awesome to know that after all these years, you look back and like, wow, this is us. Like, this is our story. Like, I'm a musician and I can play to, you know, five, 700 people and sing songs about you, but it connects to them. And good thing we stayed together because now I write music about you. And we can share that with people. So yeah, I think there's a lot of value in the staying power. But no, I, I think that's right. And, but it's also that realization, it is that honesty and that truth which comes through in your music as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I love it. I, I mean, I, 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 for me, I love John. Do you know you you know who John Prine is, of course. Of course yeah. you know, I think some of the great storytellers, and I, 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 a very good storyteller to me is Jarvis Cocker. And there's so many people, and this is weird. There's so many people in the US don't know pulp. Like they just, it's not part of their musical uh, catalog in their head. And I just don't get it. All the things and where's common people come. I know, right? Yeah, peace and with, peace and with everybody. What am I supposed to say? I don't know the words I'm supposed to say. I'm not saying all the good ones. <laughs> 
but, but, you know, I, I, but it is that truth and that sort of honesty and you look at that sort of stuff and um, and that's what I love about it because we should get back to that moment the other thing I love is humor in music where you get the yeah. juxtaposition of the really dark next to the really light and we have um there was a great series called the singing detective I don't know if you saw yeah. that where uh, which is incredibly violent, incredibly gruesome. And when the really violent moments happened, they played the most peaceful classical music. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And it's that juxtaposition, which is just sort of so shocking that it really grabbed yeah. attention. Almost like a clockwork orange. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely yeah. genre. Yeah, it is nice. I like, you know, I have a song called Get Me a Beer, which is called, you know, just about basically, you know, just, Get, stop yelling at me. I, I'm, I'm nothing without you, but just go get me a beer. <laughs> you know, let me enjoy myself. And, you know, it is what it is. I think, I think humor should be in, in all music. I think it's just part of it. But people tend to get so serious as, as a musician. Sometimes we're just too serious. And why? I mean, it's boring to be overly serious all the time. I do that. I have to be serious sometimes in my life. And other times I don't care. I kind of I'm a goofy person. I, I'd rather make people laugh. Than, than to have a very serious, thoughtful conversation. If I can make you- But it's both. I mean, the, the honest, the honest yeah. answer is Angus, it's both. So you're not, as you said beforehand, not Weird Al Yankovic, that's you just labeled. Yeah, sometimes exactly. Sometimes you are. Sometimes there's that sort yeah. of Monty Python thing and that will come through and that's brilliant. Yeah. Other times there's a serious message and you have that job. Yeah. yeah, I like my, my, I love Monty Python. <laughs> you gotta be, I met, I, I chatted with, uh, I did another thing with Queen in Las Vegas many years ago, and Eric Idle was there, and, we, and it was so cool to talk to him and to be like, wow, it's 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 you, and you're talking, and his head is so big, <laughs> like he literally has a phys physically big head, and he had heard his, he was in a, he was in a, 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 a wheelchair at the time, because he had some kind of surgery on his foot or his leg, but you bet, you mentioned Ben Elton earlier, and I, I had a wonderful conversation with Ben Elton. I'm a huge, my wife and I are huge fans of Blackadder. Yes. And, uh, and I was just like, you wrote Blackadder. I know he came on series two and stayed on after that. Um, and he also wrote the Queen musical, but yeah, yeah. he was, yeah, he was, he was pretty cool. I, I'm big, big Blackadder fan. And, and he's brilliant. He's a brilliant stand-up comic and so on and so forth. So we worked yeah. with him beforehand. And, and it's great because some people, can write and some people can perform. It's rare that people do both. And, you're, yeah. and, and Ben is such a great talent and a really nice guy. He used to do this stand-up program and sort of Friday night on, on, on uh, as part of a, a, a comedy program. And then he goes on and writes things like Blackadder and as you say, we will, yeah. it's superb. Yeah. And he's eating a lot of Vegemite. I believe he lives in Australia now. <laughs> yes, that's why you've got to have a sense of humor and you're gonna eat your Vegemite. Right. <laughs> if you're gonna fill your belly with that crap. <laughs> So, brilliant. Think of what he's writing now. <laughs> I, I know, it is extraordinary. So you're looking back, I mean, you've had a glorious career. You've, you've worked with some of the best in the industry. I think you're having yeah. a fabulous time at the moment. I love what you're doing. Looking back when you were your daughter's age, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, you know, I, I and this is weird, but I think you always, you do have to start off in a box. Like you do have to start off in a very small space to know yourself. And I didn't do that. I, I, I was more free willing. I did not think about tomorrow. I thought about, you know, 40 years from now, I wasn't thinking about really where I was at the time. So my advice to myself was, you know, get to know yourself before you start acting like somebody, you know, really understand who you are inside and out before you start projecting that out. Because I wasted a lot of years projected myself as other people or like I wanted to be that guy for this time in my life and I chose all, all, all my efforts went that way but you know and then I changed and I said I want to be that guy now and then I changed want to be that guy. I think you just need to know yourself as soon as you can to be really that true or inner self for your life. Good advice be yourself because everybody else is taken. I love that. Yeah, you said that earlier. That's exactly. a very good. It's gotta be good. I'm gonna steal that. I'm gonna steal that. Yeah, from have, it, have it. Have it. Have it. Royalties everywhere. It's gotta be good. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, Angus, it's been a real delight. I love yeah. the album. I love what you're doing. I'm, I'm looking forward to when you can come over to the UK, or I'll come over to California, and I can yeah, that's right. see that glorious red that you've got. It'd yeah, really it's not red anymore. You notice because I've noticed that. It's <laughs> I've it's changed. Changed the light. Yeah, all the lights. We have a big loft here and everything. Well, there's like 50 uh, windows. 
And so as the- I see you've got, uh, whose clothes are those behind you? You've got a, it looks like you're running up a little my wife. shop. It, yeah, that's my wife's boudoir over there. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's the, yeah. yeah, that's my that's Kensington stuff. Today. Freddie and Rod. Exactly, um, exactly. Well, we will get you and your wife up. You must come back on the show. It'd be lovely to get you both together as well. Um, oh, awesome. But in the meantime, yeah, that'd be fun. thank you so much. It's been a, it's been a blast. It's been lo lovely to speak. Thank you, Andrew. I, I appreciate all the time. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Bye bye. So thank you very much indeed to Angus Crown for being my very special guest today over there in sunny California. Uh, if you've enjoyed the show, and even if you haven't, if you've got that Marmite or Vegemite moment, uh, write to me, guests at TV. Dot com. Don't forget, you can subscribe on all of the usual platforms. Follow me at Andrew Eborn at Octopus TV, and I will see you next time. Thanks for joining me. Bye bye.